rich herbs, I have basil, rosemary, and tarragon here. Next, add finely chopped garlic, salt, freshly ground black pepper, and for a tangy touch, Dijon style mustard. The French influence here is obvious. Finally, a little freshly squeezed lemon juice, and I squeeze it between my fingers to catch the seeds. Now, puree these ingredients together and gradually work in about a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil. You could think of this as a sort of pesto where the mustard replaces the cheese. Lift up and spoon some of this mustard herb mixture under the skin. Then flatten the bird down and just sort of squeeze the herb stuffing over the thighs, over the legs. Okay. Put a little more in. We'll do this side too. Don't forget to put some of the herb stuffing in the cavity. Finally, stuff a couple of sage leaves on top of the breast under the skin. What's gonna happen is when the game hens cook, you'll see the outline of the sage leaves. Trust the bird to give it a cylindrical form. And by skewering the bird's tail to tail by, like this, you leave plenty of room for the legs to brown. Let me show you the grill. I've set up the grill for spit roasting, lit the rear infrared rotisserie burner, and also the two outside burners. So all you need to do is fit the end of the spit into the rotisserie motor and place drip pans under the game hens. Then switch on the motor and close the grill. Well, it's been 40 minutes and the birds look beautiful. But to check for doneness, you want to use your trusty instant read meat thermometer. Insert it in the deepest part of the thigh, not touching the bone. You're looking for 165. We're there. Put on grill gloves. Remember, the spit and prongs are going to be hot and put the birds on a baking sheet. And then I have one other surprise for you. So I'm just gonna take off the drip pans and I'm gonna set the grill up for direct grilling. So what you wanna do now is unscrew the prongs and then slide off your game hens. Tent the birds with foil keep you warm, and let me show you the side dish. It's grilled polenta. And polenta is a sort of cornmeal mush. Brush the tops of the polentas with extra virgin olive oil, and season with coarse salt, and freshly ground black pepper. So why do I cut the polenta shapes in half moons? Well, if you have a whole tray of polenta, and you use a round cutter, there's no waste. All right, now turn the polenta pieces over. So once the grill is raging hot, then grab the polenta and arrange it on the grill, running diagonal to the bars of the grate. The grilling time is about two minutes per side. Remember, the polenta is already cooked. Okay, so the birds have rested. And what you want to do is untruss each game hen. Just snip off the string. And then arrange the game hens on your platter.
Let's see how we did. Look at that, you can see how the herbs just soak right into the meat. Mmm, nailed it. If you like herbs, you're gonna love these spit roasted game hens. So there you have it. Japanese yakitori, Malaysian spatchcock chicken, French rotisserie game hens. When bird meets grill, Everyone wins. What you do to prepare lemongrass is you cut off then some mirin sweetened white <laughs> then some mirin sweetened white sweetened rice then some mirin sweetened riced wine. And Just like to keep you on your toes. You're looking for 165 degrees. Woo! <laughs> this really explodes with savor. Quesadilla, a grilled cheese sandwich with a Mexican twist. Fireman's corn, a great way to grill corn on the cob. Burgers two ways tailgate touchdowns every time, and pork calzones stuffed with pepperoni and cheese. Bellissimo. Today we tackle the tailgate. I'm Steven Reichlin, and from the beautiful Esplendor Resort in Southern Arizona, it's time to grill. In my playbook, the real reason for football is tailgating and no self-respecting tailgater would leave home without his grill. Whether your game is football or soccer, this show is designed to help you smoke the competition. Sometimes you discover a dish of such simplicity and yet of such ingenuity, something you'd never expect, that you just want to rush home and make it yourself. What do Italian panini, Colombian arepas, and Mexican quesadillas have in common? All three are grilled cheese sandwiches, and there's at least one you can really cook on the grill. The Mexican quesadilla is a snap to prepare and makes a great snack at a tailgate party. Here's how we make it on Primal Grill. Start with an oversized flour tortilla. This is a 12-inch tortilla. Now, sprinkle half with grated jack or white cheddar cheese. I've said jack or white cheddar, but in fact, the cheese is limited only to your imagination. Next, sprinkle the cheese with diced tomato. And thinly sliced jalapeno chilies. Finely chopped cilantro. and finely chopped scallion greens. Fold the tortilla in half and brush the top with melted butter and brush the other side with melted butter too. Next, let me show you the grill. Now, I've preheated this portable grill to high, and as always, we keep it hot, we keep it clean, with a few strokes of a grill brush, and we keep it lubricated with a folded paper towel, dipped in oil, and drawn across the bars of the grate. Conscientious cleaning and oiling are really important when you make a dish like quesadillas because the tortillas are prone to stick to the grill. And it helps to have a wide spatula to help you turn your quesadillas. 
And thanks to your conscientious grilling and buttering, the quesadilla hasn't stuck. Once the quesadillas are grilled on the other side, transfer them to a baking sheet. I told you this was quick. This is a little guacamole to go with it. The recipe is on our website. And let's see how we did. Walk, quesadilla. Mmm, nice. I really like the way the guacamole cools down that fiery jalapeno chili. So there you have it, a grilled cheese sandwich with a Mexican twist. It's a game time decision you won't regret. Husk off or husk on? It's one of the great debates in the world of barbecue. What's the best way to grill corn? The firemen in Lynchburg, Tennessee, soak the corn in a salt sugar solution, then char the husk right off the ears. Here's how we do it at Primal Grill. Step number one, cut the first inch and a half off the corn. This helps the corn absorb the liquid. Step number two, make the salt sugar solution. Now, actually, this is a sort of brine. It consists of equal parts salt and sugar. And you want to whisk these ingredients together until the crystals are dissolved. You know, as you travel the world's barbecue trail, you find grilled corn on every continent. In Mexico, they slather it with mayonnaise and sprinkle it with cheese and chili powder. In Cambodia, they baste it with coconut milk and sprinkle it with palm sugar. Okay, once the sugar and salt are dissolved, pour this mixture over the corn. Soaking time is about four to eight hours. This is best done in the refrigerator. Now, let me show you the fire. Okay, so for the fire, all I did was light a couple of chimneys worth of charcoal. And then you want to sort of rake out the coals into a single layer. Now take your corn and lay it directly on the embers. This is grilling at its most primal. Now this gets pretty hot, so it's a good idea to wear grill mitts and you can see the importance of having long handled tongs. All you need to do here is just give uh, each ear of corn a quarter turn. The idea is you want to char the husk right off the ears of corn. Now, why do you do this? Well, first of all, the surface charring gives you this incredible smoke flavor. Second of all, it looks incredibly cool. Third of all, enables you to kind of reconnect with your inner caveman. What's happening here on a molecular level is actually that the burning corn husk is smoking the corn and the fiery embers are caramelizing the plant sugars. It's an amazing way to grill corn. Another cool thing about this recipe are the sound effects. You can actually hear the corn kernels popping. Once the corn is charred on all sides, you can see it's a beautiful golden brown and the husk is mostly burned off. Simply transfer the corn to a platter, preferably a heat-proof platter. And you'll notice I'm kind of shaking each ear to knock off any live embers. And how cool does this look? So to serve and eat these guys caveman style again with your fingers, what you do is you just want to sort of strip off the burnt husk and the corn silk. You don't need to get every last little bit off. Those little charred bits give you a smoke flavor. Then baste the corn with melted butter and season it with salt, pepper, freshly ground of course, 
And if you like a little kick, a sprinkle of cayenne pepper. Mm. This is amazing. You really get the smoke flavor. So the answer to the great debate, the best way to grill corn is to burn it. For me, a recipe is a starting point, a springboard for my creativity. I think it's much more important to master the technique than the exact list of ingredients. After all, the word recipe comes from the Latin requipe, take. Take a little of this, take a little of that. The important thing is really to learn how to put it together. The surveys are in and the winner is burgers. That's what most Americans cook when they fire up the grill. Well, if your burgers look undercooked like this one or overcooked like this one, listen up. I'm going to show you two flavor-packed cheeseburgers that come out great every time. Burger number one, the butter cheeseburger. Start by adding garlic, parsley, and grated Parmesan cheese to butter that's softened to room temperature. Beat the ingredients together with a spoon to make your garlic herb cheese butter. I made a batch earlier and wrapped and chilled it in plastic wrap. Now you need your butter nice and cold so you can slice it into disks. Now take a burger patty and what you want to do is sort of make a depression in the center. Just like this. Slice off a disc of garlic herb cheese butter and press it into the center. Then bring the burger meat around the butter to encapsulate it. Now here's the idea. You really need to cook a, a burger all the way through to make it safe. So by encasing a disc of butter inside, even if the burger is well done, when you bite into it, it will be incredibly juicy, just like a rare burger. Burger number two. I call this the inside out cheeseburger. It too gives you a burger that is extremely juicy and perfectly safe. So start with grated cheddar. The secret is to mix the cheddar directly into the burger meat. So here's the idea. You really need to cook burgers to 160 degrees. By putting the cheese in the meat, as the burgers cook, the cheese melts. Once again, you bite into an extraordinarily juicy burger. You may be wondering why you can eat a steak rare, but you have to cook burgers all the way through. Well, the reason is simple. In a steak, any bacteria that might be on the surface uh, are killed when you grill the steak. In burgers, the meat is ground up, so the bacteria may be in the middle. Once the cheese is mixed in, simply pinch off about six ounces of meat and with a light touch, form it into a burger. The only other thing you need to do is season the burgers right before grilling. So start with coarse salt, sprinkle the tops, and freshly ground black pepper. Don't forget to turn the burgers over and season the other side. Let's get the burgers on the grill. Now, I've set up three charcoal grills. I clean the grill grates, and here's a cool way to oil the grill. Dip an onion in your vegetable oil. Now, arrange the burgers on the grates. Those are our butter cheeseburgers. And here are our inside out cheeseburgers. Mm -hmm. 
And whenever you handle raw ground beef, you always want to wash your hands in hot soapy water. Let me get the buns. And a great burger always has buttered toasted buns. Cooking time on these are real quick, so you want to pay attention. Meanwhile, let's take a look at our burgers. You can give each a quarter turn. And for burgers, I like to use a spatula for turning. Something you'll see guys do, and invariably they're guys, is press down on the burger with a spatula. That is a recipe for disaster. All you succeed in doing is squeezing out the flavorful juices. Handle the burgers with a light touch. Okay, and we'll check on our buns. And once the burgers are golden brown on one side, just turn them over. And check out our inside out cheeseburgers. You can actually see the cheese melting out. And once the buns are toasted, pull them off as well. See, the idea here is when you bite into the perfect burger, you get the crunch of the bun, the crisp snap of the lettuce, the meaty chew of the burger. It's like all the textures you can imagine in a single bite. And here's how you put it together. So, lettuce leaves on half the buns, and you put the lettuce leaf under the burger to keep the juices from making the bun soggy. And then onion slices on the other bun, again on the bottom to keep the buns from getting soggy. Now the burgers look done, but to play it safe, what you want to do is use your instant read meat thermometer. You're looking for 160 degrees. That's the safe temperature. And now the inside out cheeseburgers. And look how the cheese has melted. Then tomato slices for the butter burgers. And sliced dill pickles on top of the cheeseburgers. Nice, great texture, great flavor. Butter burger, inside out cheeseburger. It's a tailgate touchdown every time. In my archives, I have a photo of a painting that was done to portray uh, our early ancestors, Homo erectus, at uh, one of the first barbecues. And it shows these hairy guys hunched around a fire, ripping meat off the bones, lifting bones with meat up to their mouth and eating it. It's, it's, it's really so primal. And in a funny way, I think that's one of the reasons why people are so passionate about barbecue. You know, it takes us back to that very moment when we stopped being animals and we became man. The calzone, that pizza joint favorite, originated in Italy. But the idea of stuffing bread with cured meat seems to have sprung up around the world. Here's a calzone for people who love barbecue. You could think of it as the ultimate pork chop. Hold the bread. Step number one, start with a double thick pork loin chop. Step number two, using a utility knife and holding the chop flat with the palm of your hand, cut a deep pocket in the side to but not through the back. The pocket should run the length and breadth. Step number three, stuff the calzone with sliced pepperoni, smoked ham, provolone cheese, and a slice of dill pickle. Then take two toothpicks and insert them through the chop crosswise to close the pocket. Now brush the tops of the calzones 
with extra virgin olive oil. Then season each calzone with coarse sea salt and freshly ground black pepper. Press a fresh sage leaf on the top of each calzone. By the way, the word calzone means trousers or stockings. Then turn each calzone over and brush Season with coarse salt and freshly ground black pepper. And finally, press a sage leaf. It's a lot easier than making a calzone out of pizza dough. Okay, let me show you the grill. Preheat your grill to high. The process is direct grilling. And as always, you want to clean the grill grate with a stiff wire brush and oil the bars of the grate with a folded paper towel dipped in oil and drawn across the bars of the grate. Now let me get the calzones. Arrange the calzones on the grill grate running diagonal to the bars of the grate. So cooking time is about four minutes per side. We'll give a quarter turn after two minutes to lay on our crosshatch of grill marks. And to speed up the cooking process, I'll simply close the grill. So how do you know when it's time to turn the calzones? Well, first of all, you can see the meat is uh, starting to cook on the edges. So let's just go turn the calzone over. Yeah, baby. You can see the sage leaf is cooking right into the meat. Once again, be two minutes in this direction, two minutes in that direction, and then paradise. So how do you know when the calzones are done? Well, you can use the poke test. They feel firm to the touch. Or if you want to play it safe, use an instant read meat thermometer. What you want to do, insert it into the center of the calzone. You're looking for 160 degrees. That's medium. And we are there. And you can just close the grill. That will burn off the melted cheese. Oh, yeah. You can see how juicy it is. Benissimo. That means sweet. I love the way the pepperoni and cheese flavors the pork. So there you have it. Grilled quesadillas, fireman's corn, burgers two ways, and pork chops calzone. Whatever team you're rooting for, Primal Grill makes you a winner. See you next time. Just like you were eating a rare hamburger. It accomplishes the same purpose. Uh, you may be wondering why it's safe to eat. You may be wondering why it's safe to eat a steak rare, but you have to, um, you may be, okay, ready? We. <laughs> Matt said it two seconds before he did. <laughs>
How y'all are? I'm glad for you to see me a guarantee. I'm gonna taste this jambalaya first. Let's just go ahead on and cook. Get the part of the chicken that I like. Turtle stew, come here, boy. Mm. You know that looks good? This is going to be good, I guarantee you. Talk to it like it knows what I'm talking about. I like it, it's good. I believe in easy cooking, believe me, I do. How y'all are? I'm glad for you to see me, I guarantee. And this morning, we're gonna cook some of my favorite dishes that uh, I invented myself because I didn't have anything else to cook, so I had to cook it, like chili rice and chicken a la Creole. I didn't invent that, but I did chili rice. And I think that uh, you'll like it. In fact, I guarantee you will. Now, I've got some stories to tell you, but first of all, I've got to get this chili rice on so I can get it did quick enough for us to eat. This is a small pot. And what I got right here is two cups of rice. Now this is easy cooking, so you guys got a lot of help. Somebody cut the rice up for me, that's good. Into this rice, I'm gonna haul off and put a tablespoonful of onion powder. That's a tablespoonful of onion powder. I hope it is, that's what it is. <laughs> I, can, I can tell. And also, two teaspoonful of garlic powder. That's right, that's what it is. <laughs> and I got two teaspoonful of salt, and I generally measure those myself, because people don't believe I know how. So I'm gonna put two teaspoonful of salt. And I guarantee that's a teaspoonful. I tell you that for true. One. Two, and just a little more. <laughs> then we put a tablespoonful of chili powder. Now this is chili rice, this is chili powder. Eat chili, make you sneeze if you don't look up. And then of course I got to stir it up. Stir it all together, we got everything in I'm supposed to have, except the olive oil, and I put that in after I got the water in there. Get out of my way. And after I put the water in there, I'll stir it some more, then I'll put the olive oil. And then I'll start cooking it. Let me put the water in right now. Give me a picture. That picture now doesn't have a hole to hold it, you know that? And I cook my rice, cook this rice, just like I do any other rice. I measure it very carefully where I have the rice. And by golly, we had just enough in there. <laughs> You see, you see what I did? What I did there now, I just put to that first joint, and everybody's first joint in the finger is just alike. Check your neighbor there, see if it's, that's in your index finger, I think they call it. Oh, I'm glad I got this little dish towel. And then I put, I got the salt, I put the olive oil. And I'm supposed to measure that very carefully, but I don't do that. It's got two tablespoons. I didn't measure two tablespoons, but looking at that. That's two tablespoons. <laughs> I guarantee it is. Put that back out of my way and stir this some more. And I'm gonna move my pot over to this other side. No, I'm not, I'm gonna move this pot over there. Make the chicken a la Creole in that. Oh man, that's gonna be good, yeah. I guarantee. Stir it, get everything off the bottom. And we put this fire and bring this to a quick boil. I think this is the right one. Yeah, that's it. I got that on high. I'll let it stay there for a little bit and cook. That's hot. If you think high ain't hot, oh, I'll guarantee. And I got everything in there, and all I'm doing now, I want you to know that this is easy to fix. This is easy cooking. I put all the ingredients except the olive oil in there. You notice that. Onion powder. 
garlic powder, long grain rice, salt and chili powder, and olive oil. Now that's easy cooking, it really is. I think you're gonna enjoy that. And I've got this little clock. After I boil most of the water out of that, I, uh, in fact, you just see a little bubble in the holes in the right like that. You see a little bubble and then you got enough water out, you put a heat diffuser under it. That's what I have to put on there. This is a heat diffuser, because it won't, uh, won't scorch them rice. Too. I don't like to scorch them rice, though, not me. It don't taste good when it's scorched like that. And uh, then, uh, then I uh, put the lid on it, and I, I, I clock it 25 minutes. And if anybody comes and raises the lid on there, chop their arm off and shoot them. <laughs> when I'm cooking in my kitchen, I tell everybody, don't go messing around in my kitchen. But I stir this rice several times, but be sure I've got everything just right. And it, it looks just right to me right now. It's gonna be a beautiful brown when I get it cooked. And you all will sample a little bit of it, I hope. In fact, I'm gonna make you do that. I hold the gun on so you got to taste this, you know. But I like it, it's good. Now what I'm gonna do is just leave it here out of the way and change my recipe, because I got to start on this uh, chicken a la Creole. That take a little longer than this other one. That's a nice spoon, I'm gonna need that on the chicken a la Creole to put it over here like that. Now I wanna tell you a story. I haven't told this story in a long, long time. It has nothing to do with this. It's a story I want to tell. I got a friend who would hunt duck all the time. During the duck season, and a lot of time not in season, he goes and hunts the duck. He don't never took anybody with him. When they say, we're going to take you with him, no, you can't go with me. I don't took anybody with me. He said, you got your dog? I said, I always take five dogs with me. And he spelled it P-H-I-D-E-A-U-X, five dogs. <laughs> he said, I always take him to retrieve those duck if I got no shot him. Please take him, no can't do it. But one day a man would loan him some money to build a beautiful house, what he got. He said, I would like to go with you to hunt some duck. He said, I don't took somebody with me to hunt some duck, no. He said, how you like this house, what I loaned you the money for, Hank? Oh, I love this house. He said, how about taking you to hunt some duck, Hank? Well, you don't got to hit that kid in the face with a wet mop. He knows something going on. He said, okay. And it was cold weather. He said, pick me up tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. o'clock in the morning. We'll go in the blind and hunt the duck. He said, I'll be here at 4. Next morning at 4 o'clock, he's right there. The man come out there and get in. He said, where's Fido? He said, we don't need him. He said, look, I ain't gonna wait out in marsh and hunt them duck, it's too damn cold. Call the dog and let's go. <laughs> come Fido. Fido brought himself, got in the back of the truck. And then one time they got in that P-Rogue boat. Now, anybody that's ever been in the P-Rogue know a P-Rogue ain't even safe for one people, let alone two people and a big dog like Fido. <laughs> he said, well, let's go and get in the blind. So they went and got in the blind. Fido sat just as quiet and nice as he possibly could. And my friend says, man, it looks like we're gonna see some duck today. I'll guarantee the banking people say, I hope so. Well, he got in the blind all set and everything, and here come some duck. <laughs> <laughs> Give him that feed call, set him right down in front. And that banking people raised up with his shoot gun with two duck out there, bloom, bloom, got both of them at the same time. He said, sent the dog for the duck. He said, them duck ain't going nowhere. He said, sent the dog for the duck. Fido, go get them duck. Trip, 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 right on top of the water. He walk out there, pick up them duck, trip, 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 right back on top of the water and put them down. That bank of people didn't say a word. In a few minutes, here come two more duck, big millard, and a bunch all by themselves. And he called <laughs> Even that feed cold and he sit right down there. He raised up with his twice barrel carabine, bloom, bloom, killed them duck, dead, dead. The bank of people say, sent the dog for the duck. He said, don't worry about them duck. I know they ain't going nowhere. They dead, dead. He said, sent the dog, let's got some argue. Let them got some argue about that. He said, Fido, go get them duck. Fido, tip, 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 right on top of the wall. Pick them duck up, tip, 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 right back on top of the wall, put the duck down. 
that banking people didn't say a word. He said, I didn't sit something at first because I believe my eyes were playing a trick on me. But did you see that dog walk out there on top of the water, pick up them duck, walk back on top of the water and put them duck down? Huh? He said, yeah, and that embarrassed me more than I never told you. I never could talk that damn dog how to swim. <laughs> Now, you notice I got a good high ball on this, and what I got to do is kind of cut it down a little bit so that it'll put it on a medium, so it'll still cook, and cook all the water out of there, and it turn the color, turn it a nice brown there. Now, ain't that nice? I <laughs> guarantee it is. Now, over here, I got another pot, and I'm going to change place with that, put that there, because it got to go on there. And then here, I'm gonna make a, a chicken a la Creole. And we got all kind of stuff got to go in there, pretty stuff. And I'm gonna put it in there. Let me kind of clean up this a little bit and get it out of my way so I can get this other stuff a little closer to me. Yeah. Now, what I've done to show you how easy cooking is, I've used dried vegetables and everything except I got, the, this is wet hot sauce. This is good wet steak sauce, and all of these, are, that's tom tomatoes, we, we'll tell you about them and we put them in there. But this is a, this makes for about six, seven, it depends on who's hungry, but it comes out real good. I got a, a quarter cup of dried onion, right here. I'm gonna do that with that. No, I'm not eating them. Yeah, I'm going to put it in this pot, right? there, just like this. Don't drop it in there. At least I thought I was. <laughs> I'm going to use this little spoon. That, oh, they, they don't took up all the water. That's good stuff. Put it in there. And get it all out of there, too. Don't be messing around and leaving it in good dry on. They taste just like regular. You never know the difference when you taste this. I may have to use you again, I can tell. And then I put in there, according to this recipe I got here, a tablespoonful of dried green onion. You see that? It was a dried green onion. Put them in there too. And those haven't got any fire under there, because they don't have enough water to have fire yet. And I'm gonna put some chicken stock in there. And then, when I put some more, Dry parsley, this with dry parsley. Put that water on there. It makes it go good. Here let's go. Put all this in here just like and get all that parsley out because parsley helps flavor things. I don't, I don't use a lot of celery to cook because all you taste is celery a lot of times, so I don't use a lot of that. Now, and then, corner this thing here, I put a teaspoon, a teaspoon full of garlic powder. That's one teaspoonful of garlic powder. We'll put that on there. We didn't put water with that. We didn't have to. And then I put in here dried mint. I'm gonna wait a little bit to put that dried mint. What I'm gonna do is put some other stuff in there so I can stir her up. And what I'm gonna put in there right now is some rotel. No, I'm not. I'm gonna put white wine first, just a little wine. That's to take the bitterness out of tomatoes. Tomatoes have a bitterness in them. Onion have bitterness in them. I'm gonna put a little water. Look, that's a, a cup of white, white Chablis wine. It's good enough to drink. If it ain't good enough to drink, don't cook with it. You hear? Me? <laughs> just remember that. Go ahead and cook there, boy. I'll have to stir my rice one more once. Yeah, it's going good. Yes, it is. Take it off the bottom. Have to lower that fire some more while I'm thinking about it. Lower the fire a little bit more. Then I'll put it on simmer when I put this heat diffuser under there. Now, this is a medium, this is a, a, a low, medium, low fire. It's good, still cooking. Now, I'll go ahead and fix this uh, chicken a la Creole. Now, what I'm going to put on that is some chicken stock. 
when we boil the chicken, and I'm gonna turn that fire on too, right this minute. Let's go here, boy. If you can find the right thing, got it. Fire lights right away. Put it on high and stir. You got to stir this a little bit. And you're looking good there. Now I'm gonna put some Rotel. They ain't nothing in the world but seasoned spiced tomatoes. That's all they are, but they're good. I like them very much. Rotel. If you think that ain't hot, you're wrong. It is hot. Put it on there like that. And then I put some eat or can whole tomatoes. But we, we spiced them up real good, see, so that we wouldn't uh, we would put them in there. It would, it would be easier to eat really like that. We're going to put that in there. This is uh, just good old whole tomatoes. You could use fresh tomatoes if you wanted, wanted to, put them in a blender or something like that, but that, that's too hard. This is easy cooking I'm trying my best to do today, and I'm going to do it. Look at that. Good. Now I'm going to put of all oh, three tablespoons full of steak sauce. Creole ketchup, it used to be called, but it's now steak sauce. Whenever you put anything in there, always stir. Just stir a little bit. How many tablespoons? Two tablespoons. That's what my recipe called for. I can't remember three tablespoons full of steak sauce, yeah. One, two, three. One of them tablespoons wasn't quite full. <laughs> Let's add a little bit more to it. Got it going. All right. And then it says in the recipe to put some hot sauce, a little down of hot sauce, or some cayenne pepper, whichever one or two. The two I'm going to put about less than a, less than a teaspoon full in because I know that the rotel is in there. So what I'm going to do is put about that's a half a teaspoon. I'd bet money on it. I guarantee. <laughs> and then I got to stir. There we go. Hmm. You know that spoon gets hot in there. I guarantee you do it. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Let me tell you something, not, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be good, I guarantee. I got the cup, the tomatoes in there, everything. And the only thing I don't have in there are two things. I haven't got the dried mint in there, and I don't got the chicken in there. But I'm going to put it in there, don't worry, none. I guarantee I'm going to do that. Got the onions, the green onion, the good uh, parsley and the garlic powder with uh, two cups of, of chicken stock, that's what they did, plus the water that you use to get the, the, the dried vegetables to not be dry some more, you know. Now, I got all that right there, and what I'm gonna did is put that chicken with that right this minute if I can get to it. Get out of my way and give me that dish towel. That's the handiest thing in the world a dish towel is. I couldn't cook what I want. Come here, old, old chicken. Now what we did, we boiled this chicken. These are nothing but second joints. They call it the, the tie in all these big shoot places. And uh, we didn't cook that. I'm gonna put a lid on that in just a second. This chicken, then it was cooked in seasoned water. Tastes good, too. You're going to need another thing. So we're going to put that in there and put the dried mint. Now, you notice I'm using dried mint. I used to use bay leaf all the time. I love bay leaf. But bay leaf is a, a known taste killer. You put too much bay leaf, ain't nothing you can do about it. It's going to stay there. It's gonna, all you're going to taste is bay leaf. So I don't use it anymore. I use mint, and it's easier to handle, and it doesn't kill the, doesn't take over the flavor. 
if people wonder what they're tasting, it's men. That's what they taste it. Well, not, well, not to tell them that, but that's what it is. And I got to bring this to a boil, and it's going to come to a boil in a minute. Now, put the chicken to it. See, I put it, that shit looks like white meat. It's tired. Come off a of white chicken. <laughs> This is a full cup of this, four cups of, of white tires, or just tired tires. I'll never forget, I was in in, in Shreveport, Texas, went with a man. We went to a chicken place and had some chicken. He was from Markville, Louisiana, in, in the Volpe. Pure bleed, pure bleed Cajun. And the little waitress came over and said, can I do anything for you? He said, yes, ma'am. He, he said, I would like to have two tires and a wing. She looked at me kind of funny. She said, what do you say? He said, I would like to have two ties in a wing. And she looked at me and said, what did he say? I said, he said he wanted two ties in a wing. I thought she going to hit us boy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she should have. Now, this I got to put a lid on this rice. It's uh, chili rice. You can see it it's all of the just heat defuse it down first, put the lid, and turn the fire down to a simmer. And you let that simmer. It ain't down to a simmer yet, but it got to get on there. Now it is. I'm gonna let that simmer for 25 minutes, is what it's gonna do. Now, what I got to do is get my food over there where I can taste this to be sure it's worth eating. Now, I'm gonna put a lid on this pot too. But I gotta turn that fire down after I put the lid on. I wanna get a little of this rice. Got it right here. Come here, right? That's not too hot for me to handle. What I want to do is get my plate and bring it over here. That'd be a lot easier, but I may spill that. I don't want to do that. And get my chicken a la Creole. I fixed up when nobody was looking. It still tastes the same, though, I guarantee. <laughs> and go over here and put this on my plate. Hmm. 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 But first, I'm going to put a little on. Um, that chili rice in there. It's hot, yeah. Come here, chili rice. Gotcha. And I'm gonna use this spoon to get some chili rice on that. Just a little, all I want is a little. And the same spoon, I'll go get some of this chili, some of this chicken a la Creole, and just put it on my the rice. Because I didn't cook it in white rice, I had chili rice, and it's good enough. Now, sit yourself down and taste that juice. Damn, I'm gonna do just exactly that. And pour myself just a little taste of wine, you know how that is? A little taste of wine. Now, you're supposed to use that white wine, but it's chicken, but I'll, I prefer red wine. So that's what I'm gonna drink right now. Yeah, let's go. Got to taste that. See if it's any good. Mmm, hmm. Mmm, hmm. Mmm, hmm. I guarantee that's good. Mm, mm, mm. No napping, but I got my dish towel. <laughs> and a little taste of wine is to you, bless your heart. How y'all are? I'm glad for you to see me, I guarantee. I'm gonna taste this jambalaya first. Let's just go ahead on and cook. 
get the part of the chicken that I like. Turtle stew, come here, boy. Mm. You want to look good? This is going to be good, I guarantee you. Talk to it like it knows what I'm talking about. I like it. It's good. I believe in easy cooking. Believe me, I do. <laughs> How y'all are? I'm glad for you to see me, I guarantee. I'm gonna make you a roux. We'll talk about it, I've got it most made. And then we'll make a rabbit gumbo. Who in is that good? <laughs> Let me turn this fire on right now while I'm thinking about it. There you go, I got fire. I also, I'm gonna have to turn this fire on here and stir this roux because I started that a little early because I didn't have anything else to do, so I just sat down here and made a damn roux. <laughs> and it, uh, it looks good. Yes, it does. And I got a bunch of stuff got to go in it, and I got to turn the fire on under it, too. Now we got it. Go to low, that's medium, medium low. But that roux is just exactly the right color, like good chocolate, only it's not chocolate, no. And I got to tell you all one story before I get started. It's a true story that happened to me and my papa years and years ago when we were in Lafayette, Louisiana. Now, I like Lafayette, but there's one thing I can tell you about it. It's the only town I've ever been in my life where you can get in one, one street and you can get lost. <laughs> and we were lost. Papa and I were lost and bad. And uh, he said, look, we're not going anywhere. Would you mind? That says a young boy over there stop. Let's just ask him where we're going to go, huh? I said, OK, Papa. So we stopped, and he said, come here, son. I want to ask you something. The little boy came over, and he said, son, can you turn what this road on the right hand would take me if I got on that, huh? The little boy said, mister, I hate to tell you this, but me, I don't know. Papa said, well, how about the, on this road on the left hand? Now, can you tell me that, that road would go up if I get on that, huh? He said, again, I hate to tell you this, mister, but me, I don't know. Papa said, look, son, like I'm looking straight ahead. Can you tell me that road would go if we got on that, huh? Little boy said, mister, it broke my heart to tell you this. But me, I don't know that, too, though. Papa said, now, son, we're not going to do it, but suppose we turn around and go just like we come from. Can you turn that road we took me if I do that, huh? Little boy said, Mr. On the ground is my heart broken. One million piece is broke so bad. But me, I don't know that, too, no. Papa said, son, you don't know a damn thing. Little boy said, that's right, but I ain't lost. <laughs> Now, in this roux that I made here, I want to tell you what I put in it. I put about a cup of olive oil, or if, I, if I'd had good bacon drippings, I would have used that. Tastes more better. And also, I put two and a half cups of flour, and I started stirring the minute I put it in there. Now, that is looking good. Into this roux, I'm going to put some onion. I'm going to put, let me move this, this roux thing that I know by heart. Anybody want to ask a question about Rue, you can ask me when the show is over. I'll be glad to tell you. I got right here two cups of chopped onion. And we're going to put them in here right now in this Rue because it's just brown enough. You just want to get it to, to the brown. I got it there right now, and you can see on the camera that it's just right. Put this in here and stir a little bit. Anytime you add anything when you cook in Cajun style, you got to stir every time you add something. If you do that, you're going to get it right. If you don't do that, it may come out right, but most probably it ain't. I'll stir that in there, and I'm, I'm going to brown this and cook these onions at the same time. There we go. Now, in this pot right here, I got some water. I think I got about eight cups of water in there. And into that water, after I get the rest of this stuff in here, this is bell pepper. It's a, let's see, that's a half a cup of bell pepper, chopped. My hand clean, moist to me, excuse me. 
Still that to into this good. Yeah, I'm here too. Go ahead on there, you're doing right. And then I got to put some celery. And this is one of the few things I use celery for, rabbit gumbo. I usually just use parsley. But I got celery in there now. And uh, I've got to get me some water in a few minutes because I'm not going to pour my wine. I'm going to pour my wine in here. Mm-hmm. That's looking good. Come on, Sherry. Let's go in here right now. Ah, doing good. And while, as soon as I get this stirred a little bit, I'm going to put some parsley. That's about a half a cup of celery I put in there. That's a half a cup of chopped fresh parsley. It's all fresh vegetable we got on here today with this stuff. Now, I make things like this sometimes with dried vegetables, but I don't do it like this, no. Now, okay. Come on, parsley. Let's get that in there. Put that there. And while this is doing, I'm gonna go get me about a cup of water I'm gonna pour in here in just a few minutes there. And before I put it in with the rest of it. But while I'm thinking about it, I'm gonna put that two cups of dry white wine. This is Chablis. Good to drink, good to pour in gumbo, don't make no difference. Don't ever cook with a wine that you won't drink. <laughs> when you buy what cooking wine, there's no telling what all's in it that'll change the taste of everything that you got. And you know, Cajun people are funny about that. They like to do their own arranging, uh, things like that, and sauces and stuff. I know I do, 